Welcome everybody to our webinar today entitled Five Steps to Getting Started with Tableau CRM. Thank you for joining. I'm gonna be one of your hosts today, Colin Gelfer with Atrium. I lead our customer engagement team. Also joining me today, I have one of my colleagues, Jeff Burns, VP of Customer Success. So before we jump into the, the content here, I realize that for many of you, Atrium might not be a household name just yet. So before we get into the, the meat of it, just a little context on our organization. So Atrium is a platinum Salesforce consulting partner that is focused on taking insights from Einstein or Tableau for CRM, both descriptive analytics and machine learning generated insights and pushing those into the workflow uh, of an end user so that they can take action. And that action is often taken in cloud applications like sales cloud, service cloud, marketing cloud, or really the broader um, Salesforce platform. So at Atrium, we really wanna to bring together three elements, CRM strategy paired with data science skills and the ability to implement cloud applications with a data-driven approach. Salesforce really being chief among those, those applications. And we're doing this with some of Salesforce and Einstein's largest customers. I'm not gonna re-throw all those right now. Um, and really, typically, we're helping customers in one of three ways, really helping to shape their strategies, to take a data-driven uh, approach uh, to really addressing their business problems. Um, we can certainly help out with the implementation of these solutions and we also offer a managed service uh, that we call Elevate to really help with the long-term care and feeding of these solutions. Now, before we jump into our topic today, the five steps for getting started with Tableau CRM, I, I do like to share our mindset here. You know, at Atrium, we're, and I think a lot of you are probably seeing this as well, we're really seeing this big evolution uh, and this big shift with enterprise systems for some of us who've been in consulting for a while, maybe not back to the 80s, but certainly the 90s, we were all implementing systems of record where we were asking, you know, our end users to crank in a bunch of data into a database. And, you know, in some cases, they got a, a static dashboard report out of that. And in a lot of ways, it was a, a management tool, um, you know, from a forecasting perspective. But, you know, adoption was typically pretty challenging. And I think if you asked your end users, you know, what was in it for you? Uh, you know, they, they would probably say it was a little bit lacking. Um, certainly a big shift towards systems of engagement in the 2000s, uh, Salesforce obviously being one of the leaders in that movement towards systems of engagement, really being able to access your data anywhere, uh, collaborate around that data, get it on your mobile device. Uh, cloud was such a huge enabler of that. And now we're seeing another big step forward, and that's this notion of systems of intelligence. And really, it's an opportunity for you to give back to your end users things like recommendations, inline analytics, notifications to make these solutions smarter and inform how they prioritize their day, how they engage with their customers. And really underpinning all of this is analytics and data and machine learning models. So the great thing here is ultimately this drives better adoption, right? It becomes a virtuous cycle. As we draw folks into these solutions through these recommendations and these notifications, it also helps with the care and feeding of this data and user adoption. So this is the big shift that we are certainly seeing in the marketplace. And that's really kind of the start of our discussion today around the five steps for getting started. And this is a question I get asked all the time. Hey, how do you get started with analytics on the Salesforce platform or Tableau for CRM or, or machine learning? And really the first step is honestly to take the first step and realize that now is the time. And certainly a lot of us are aware of these big macro trends that are out there today in terms of just overall data growth, the move to public cloud. So more and more data making its way up to public cloud. You know, we see uh, compute power increasing over time at dramatic rates. And then, you know, certainly uh, you see here with this third point around the economic value that people are expecting to get out of these solutions. Right. So the economist is saying that by, you know, 2021, AI augmentation, that can potentially deliver up to three trillion in business value. Really, the time to get started is now. Take the first step. Look for ways to really exploit your data to drive a better experience for your customers, for your employees. So that's really step one. 
step two, it's really all about understanding your starting point. At Atrium, we're big believers in benchmarking our clients, kind of where are they at today? And then where can they, through progression of this maturity curve, where can they really start to recognize business value by adding in additional capabilities? A lot of our customers are still, you can see it reflected here, level one, maybe they're doing some basic self-service reporting. You know, first step for them is, hey, how can we get embedded analytics into the workflow to help drive decision-making? And then from there, often we're helping companies really uh, take that next step around building their first model. Maybe taking some of those initial data sets and trying to drive a, you know, a predictive model um, where we can look at the propensity of an outcome or maybe try to predict the value. From there, as we progress up the maturity curve, it's all about how do we drive automation based on these insights or next best actions. So it's really important that you understand kind of where you're at on this maturity curve. And this is an exercise that we typically help clients navigate is, you know, at each of these steps, what business value can we clean and what capabilities do we need to enable to take advantage of that data and some of those macro themes that we talked about. Third step is quite simply pick the right use case. Um, and here you can see we've got four main pillars that really tackle what we would see in kind of the, uh, the customer engagement space. I would say from a use case perspective, there's really three high traffic use cases that we're seeing uh, on the Salesforce platform today uh, with Tableau for CRM. You know, certainly a lot of focus around customer acquisition. How do I fill the top of the funnel more effectively? How do I improve win rates with my customers? How do I progress prospects maybe from one stage to another throughout their journey? So certainly customer acquisition is a big focus. The second one would be around growth and retention. Now that I have this customer, how do I ensure that they don't churn, right? How do we expand the footprint? How do we address white space within a given customer? So a lot of focus around growth and retention. And then the third area, we see a lot of interest around predictive forecasting. So not just the ability to call a number or understand if an opportunity is likely to close, but can we identify those quality revenue streams and make sure that we're doing that in a predictable fashion. Now, there are a whole host of use cases outside of those high traffic use cases I mentioned at Atrium. We're actually even predicting airline parts that are likely to fail and, and generating a preemptive service event to, to address that. So, you can go really as, as far and deep as you want with the Salesforce platform on some of these capabilities, but those are certainly the, the high traffic use cases that we see. And the last thing I'll call out on picking the right use case is, you know, there's, there's certainly a litmus test that we see to really kind of score those use cases. The first one, is it actionable, right? Can we action on that insight? The second is, do we have the data available or the signal in our data to drive one of these models? And then the third and probably most important is what's the business value associated with this use case? And so if we can check the box on those, those three items, usually that's a good indication that we're headed down the right path. As we go down this path and, and really try to surface the, the important use cases, we like to use a framework. And you can see that here on this slide that really breaks it down into to five key components. Uh, the first being outcomes. And I talked about this a little bit earlier around business value, but having that top of mind in terms of what outcomes we're trying to drive towards is, is critical. So are we trying to improve win rates? Are we trying to drive margin? Are we trying to address retention or renewals? Having those outcomes front and center is going to be critical um, as you get started down this path. And then understanding who's going to consume those insights. And more importantly, how do they action on those within their workflow should all be part of your, your use case definition. And then from there, we kind of back into, okay, what data do we need to, to drive these models and these analytics for this particular use case? So step four, highly recommend, make sure you have really a, a framework to, to really evaluate these use cases and go through a, a structured process. And here, just kind of uh, putting a bow on this, one of the uh, techniques that we really enjoy here at Atrium using is uh, this notion of an intelligent experience workshop allows us to build consensus across both business and IT on how to drive forward with one of these use cases that we put through our, our framework here. And it's, you know, a lot of time spent trying to understand kind of the day in the life of somebody who's going to consume these insights so that we ensure that they're actually actioning on these um, and, and driving value in their workflow. 
And the last step before I turn it over to Jeff here is, you know, I think it's important to kind of rethink your data stack. Folks who think about kind of typical BI solutions, right? Usually you have your kind of your visualization stack. Um, if you were to approach this from a, a machine learning standpoint, you know, there's a lot of different point solutions out there uh, to address machine learning today. One of the reasons that we're big proponents of Einstein or Tableau for CRM is because it pulls together these two stacks, right? Both the visualization and the machine learning into one solution, uh, very much complementary of each other. And then you've got the, kind of the underlying infrastructure to support things like connecting with outside data sources, you know, surfacing those models within the workflow. So step five is kind of rethink how you're really engaging with your data and, and the technologies that you have in the mix and maybe look for a stack that combines both the visualization elements as well as the, the machine learning capabilities. So just want to leave you with kind of the five thoughts around how to get started. You know, time is now, plot your journey, right? Spend a lot of time thinking through the use case, hopefully with some type of framework and then you know, rethink the, the data stack that you're leveraging to drive some of this work. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, who's gonna walk us through uh, some customer success stories. Thank you, Colin. And um, I'll talk through two stories in particular and, and the journeys that these customers work through kind of in context of the five steps that we, we talked about here. So I'll start with Avaya. The, the conversation started with Avaya, and, and, and Avaya was an early adopter uh, focused on the forecasting use case. If you're like Avaya, you know, you probably have an experience where you've got, you know, a few thousand folks globally out there in the field, all managing your customers. And in Avaya's case, uh, they were submitting forecasts, even though they were a longtime Salesforce customer, a lot of forecasting was being done. Uh, via spreadsheet. So you'd have kind of your typical scenario where you've got your finance forecast top down, algorithm driven. You've got your sales ops forecast, also algorithm driven, looking at historical data, kind of rules based, all spreadsheet driven. And then you've got your sales forecast, your field forecast. And that would be a process of kind of passing around the spreadsheets, right? What are we going to do? In, uh, in any given time period, it was kind of a weekly snapshot and then it would take them roughly a week to kind of roll it up across the organization, very manually intensive, without a lot of connection to kind of that, the deal level. It's kind of like, what's my closest to the pin week over week over week? And uh, so that was kind of the, the, the setup and the so that was the challenge. What Avaya was really going after was, gosh, how do we bring together what we're calling across our organizations in a more real-time way? And how do we do that in a manner that helps us to drive accountability down to kind of the, the deal level, the rep level in the process of that, right? So that was really what, what uh, Avaya was after. So uh, really driving productivity out of a process and then returning time back to the sales team so that they could be more focused on working deals. The solution that we focused on here was really a multi-pronged approach to developing that forecast. It was uh, a focus on what exists today in the pipeline in Salesforce. What is the stuff that comes in through distribution or partner channels that we don't necessarily have visibility to? So the drop-in or that comes through digital channels, right? So we call those blind bookings. And how do we marry these things together so that we can quickly get to What's going to close? What's not going to close? What's actionable? And uh, what are the things that we can't see, but that we can expect? So that was the solution. Uh, a number of different models that came into play with, with that solution, a number of different approaches that came into play to, to address those models. And, and, and the result was really after an initial period, this was about six months, of the ability to see the information in real time, both from a rep perspective and a manager perspective, and being able to action that. Interestingly, over the course of this journey, what we found was that while we were going after initially productivity, what we found is that there was a real play to drive for win rate, actionability. How do we ensure that our deals will close and drive up our win rate, not just get to a more productive 
experience for the sales team. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The way that this tend to, tended to visualize from a management perspective out of VIA is we could see our current quarter forecast. We've got some numbers blacked out here. We could see our, our closed one. What's our propensity forecast? What's in our pipeline that we think that our sales team is saying is going to close based on probability? What are the blind bookings associated with that? So historically, what tends to come in? And that's predictive. And then what does Einstein say we're going to do, right? And where do we have gaps? And we can look at those gaps across regions, across product segments, across teams. And where we have those gaps, we can start to generate a new conversation and have coachable moments across our teams. The way that we accomplish that is, and this is kind of the journey of exploring our business, exploring our data signals, learning more about it, and then surfacing the, the right experience for, for the right folks. So if you look at 2019, that's kind of where they started. And then if we look at 2020, this is, this is where we landed um, in, in the current state of the program. And we really looked at this in kind of two buckets. So what's going to drive for accuracy and what's going to drive for actionability, right? So Colin talked about the, the driving for outcomes and the steps to get started. And, you know, do we have the data? Is it in Salesforce? Can we action it at scale, right? And the val what value is that going to drive? And so in, in Avaya's case, we looked at a series of forecast models that were going to drive for actionability. And that was slightly more engineered data, less actionable, but highly accurate, right? And then we looked at, well, what can we really action? What are the things that we can, that can come into a play in the form of a deal health model that will help us drive for win rate? And we can put these together in a single rep experience. And you see that in the lower right-hand side of this slide, right? So what's the chance of an opportunity closing? And what are the things that I should be looking at that are going to drive a different action framework for me in Salesforce to ensure the highest probability of closure? And so both from a manager perspective, as well as record level context for a rep perspective, and then from an architecture perspective, was a series of models driving for whether a deal is going to close in a given time period. And that's more of a bottoms up propensity against opportunity weighted value. And then what is that more linear prediction on what we can expect to drop in that is not yet reflected in the pipeline, again, marrying that together and then having a real time card right within my rep experience so that I can start to see the things that I can be doing to, uh, to generate the, the best outcome. So that was the journey for Avaya. If we look at the next slide here, we'll talk about Staples for a little bit. So Staples was a little bit different. Uh, we're all familiar with Staples, a uh, big office supply company. And Staples challenge was they had reps with large territories, large numbers of accounts. And the question was, where do I focus to ensure that I'm doing the best job of serving my customers? I'm reducing churn to the greatest extent possible. And we're keeping our business running and healthy across our territory. And as a rep, I might have you know, one to 300 accounts potentially, right? So the territories are large. Where do I focus my efforts? Where do I focus my team's efforts? And so the solution for Staples was really a customer retention uh, model where we would look at forecasted degradation of business over time. So order patterns, account touch patterns, what, you know, how often are we touching our customers? How do we start to correlate these types of things to ensure that we're going to have stable and growing business? And as part of that, there was the modeling component around where are we gonna see degradation or where are we gonna see growth? But then there's also the actionability part of it. Again, reinforcing that adoption through what's gonna be actionable to provide value. So for Staples, we had the concept of sales place. So what sales place do we run for our customer to ensure that we're providing them the best service that we can to ensure that they're gonna continue using our products? And so is this marriage of the prediction with the actionable sales play that helps Staples to derive value uh, out of this. Uh, we can kind of see that in action here and we're, we're happy to, to share the information here. But as an example, as an inside sales rep, I can log into Salesforce. I can see kind of the, one of the hot points within my territory of where I should be focused. Where do I have the greatest risk of churn or, or degradation? And I can quickly drill into those areas and I can see the sales plays within Salesforce. I can select a sales play and go execute on that sales play. Now, as a, as a manager, I can see the roll-up of that information with an Einstein, 
successfully. I can see where the sales plays are being executed. I can see where the hotspots are across all my team's territories. And I can dive into that. I can get that insight to action framework from Einstein right into Salesforce, from Tableau CRM right into Salesforce. And I can have coachable moments with my team. And then between my, my manager and our sales rep, we can also coordinate with our site management folks, right? We can direct our teams and quarterback our teams who are on site, who are really managing, you know, successful usage of our products at the customer level, at the site level to go run their plays as well. And then there's this concept of a citizen data scientist. So it's really a marriage, it's a blend of business experience, process experience, business analyst skill set with data skills, right? This is a big thing that we're focused on developing at Atrium within our practice. And we've been at it now for three years in developing the skill set. And it's something that our clients are all developing as well to be successful in their programs. And so in Staples' case, they've got the ability to understand their business and continuously monitor and manage the predictions and the models that they have in place so that they can drive successful execution and usage of the tool. So that's a little bit about Staples. I think at this point, Colin, we're gonna open it up for some questions, is that right? Yep, that's right, Jeff. Happy to take questions from any of the uh, folks attending. And this is a reminder, anyone put your questions here in the chat and we'll be happy to take those. Colin and Jeff, thanks for that. Um, we did have a couple questions come in to me directly. Yeah. Um, the first um, with, and I'll let you guys volley for who takes them, but uh, first is what are some of the common mistakes to avoid when getting started with a Tableau CRM project? I, I think one of the, the biggest uh, mistakes that we would see when folks are getting started is they think of it just as a data science project. And I think where the success of these types of initiatives are really determined is what we would call like the last mile. It's the workflow. It's how this information is being actioned and consumed. And, you know, um, it's also how we, you know, kind of think through iterating on these solutions. So now that somebody's actioning on this information, or in some cases, maybe they're not taking the recommendation. Do we have that level of traceability um, into who's consuming these insights? And so that last mile, I think, is the most important piece. I don't want to minimize um, the data science aspects, uh, but in a lot of ways, that's where we're kind of determining success or failure with a lot of these, these initiatives around AI and machine learning. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I would add to that. Um, it's, it's real easy for analysts to, to create analytic solutions for analysts and for data scientists to create data science solution for data scientists. Um, that end user experience is so key for last mile adoption. I'd say the other thing is, um, and I, th this came into play with Avaya as well. Um, we started the journey as a product, or excuse me, as a project, right? And it was, you know, how can we get to a forecast as a project? The more we dug in to analyze the data, to analyze their process, to analyze the experience that needed to be delivered for this thing to be successful, um, we really started to look at it more as a product, right? Which required an ongoing continuous program. And so the mindset really shifted from project-based to program-based. And I think as all of us look at our journeys to harness our data as a strategic asset, we need to think about it programmatically. Um, you're gonna wanna look at, you're gonna want continuous improvement as you look at your data signal, you understand more about your business, you understand where um, the improvement areas are. You're gonna wanna continuously kind of improve the fidelity of your models improve the prescriptiveness of your action frameworks and improve the actionability of your analytics. And um, so look at that as a, as a continuous process and, and not as kind of like a one and done type of project. Great, okay, thanks. Um, and then one other question here um, as we round out our half hour together. Uh, just what's the typical time frame for someone to realize an ROI? I know that's a big number, maybe, or a big question, maybe impact. How, how does, how do you show impact on the business in the shortest amount of time? Uh, I'll, I'll lead off with that one. And um, 
It will really depend on use case, of course, but I will start with that many of these projects um, typically land somewhere in the time frame of, of 12 to 16 weeks, kind of that for that initial MVP. And when we're defining what that minimum viable product is, it's, it's what's that first model contextualized in a set of descriptive analytics that can be placed kind of at the right place in the business process surfaced within Salesforce. Um, the 12 to, to 16 weeks is pretty typical for that time frame to start deriving value. Um, now, from a use case perspective, if we're talking about a lead management use case, we've seen anywhere from, you know, five to 40% improvements in conversion rates. And typically we're at the lower end of the range when we're talking about an MVP, but then you start to understand your models, you start to understand your data signal, you look at different parts of the business differently, have different action frameworks around that and you really drive up the level of value that you can get out of that over time. So that's more of kind of a lead management customer acquisition scenario. Um, there's opportunity scoring and win rate. I would also say the same time frame applies in that high traffic use case. Um, and um, harder to measure or you know, empirically around the value of that, but we have seen improvements, um, measurable improvements in close rates as, as a result of that. And certainly productivity improvements across sales teams. Um, from a retention perspective, Colin, you're a little bit closer on that one. Maybe you can speak to that one. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting. I, I, we've seen folks uh, kind of in the same time frame. like when I go back to the, the Staples example, Jeff, kind of in that 12 to 16 week range. Um, but again, it's something that they're, you know, they're going to continue to iterate on over time. Um, and for, you know, a lot of our, our clients, the, this is really driving towards kind of bigger, more strategic outcomes. I was actually on a call the other day with a large insurance company and the business case for their program around policy retention is like a half a billion dollars, which it sounds crazy, but when you think of the scale they're operating at and you know where they think they can make improvements in their in their business, it's 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 pretty amazing. So um, but yeah, I, I think the the key thing is getting value out to the business early and then continuing to monitor, measure, refine, and iterate um, so you can recognize that value. With regards to the staples use case, um, there was a, a, a number mentioned around AUC and the question is pertaining to how much focus should be placed on retraining the model prior to rolling it out? And I guess more broadly, how often should you revisit some of these models to make sure that they're giving you accurate predictions? So um, I think that's really at the crux of that question. So uh, Jeff or, or Colin, I'll, yeah. I'll turn it over to you to answer that one. Yeah, so I was going to say that the, the answer to the frequency of the retraining is going to depend on a, a couple of different factors. Um, we actually do have an asset around model monitoring that allows us to this kind of continuous monitoring of the model's effectiveness. Um, so if we see certain uh, metrics start to drop, that might be a key indication for, for uh, retraining. I would say the other thing that's been interesting this year is... Um, you know, business patterns have, have changed pretty dramatically, right? And so detecting what those new patterns are, maybe folks have had to go and kind of retrain their models to adjust. Um, so, you know, to really do, to really be successful with these solutions, you've got to kind of have that muscle memory around, hey, um, constant care and feeding, iterate, refine, adapt, um, find new patterns. To Jeff's point, it's, it's, it's not a one or done. I think we, um, outside of like step function changes in, 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 in the economy, like, like we saw uh, this year with COVID, um, it's common to see, you know, quarterly, I'd say at most, but more, more commonly six month refreshes. Um, although a lot of our, our clients, because they take programmatic approaches to continuous improvement in the models, uh, always looking for additional features, always looking to get more refinement in, in, in the level of prescriptiveness that they can get out of their predictions. There's kind of, it's, it's just kind of like always part of the process, right? That, that continuous monitoring improvement um, if, if you're approaching it that way. But minimally, I'd say, you know, you know every three to six months, uh, and that can be done very quickly when you're talking about the uh, Tableau CRM and, and Einstein stack. 
last uh, or first off, just thank you for for attending the workshop. If you guys want to learn more um, and maybe, you know, uh, maybe need some help kind of exploring this further, maybe getting down into some more uh, details around use cases, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can contact me directly. My email's right there. And then just one last plug here. Um, we've got a lot of thought leadership content that we're uh, posting. Um, so please follow us on LinkedIn. Feel free to visit our, our blog on our website. A um, lot of good content around how to get started with machine learning, AI, a lot of good customer stories. So um, feel free to, to tap into that as well. And again, thank you for, for making the time and hopefully we'll connect with some of you here in the near future. Thanks everyone.